O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Friends, as we begin this morning service, we unite our hearts in the fellowship of prayer. Eternal God, as we assemble within your sanctuary, coming here this morning, reflecting upon your great sacrifice, we give you thanks, dear God, that we can experience deep in our hearts the incredible nature of your grace and your love. As we worship Heavenly Father, we contemplate upon the great price, a price that you paid for our sins. Come and draw us together to embrace and forgive one another as we confess our humanity, our fragility, and our need of your spirit. Help us, dear God, as we endeavor to be your hands and feet to the poor and the oppressed. As we leave your sanctuary, help us to carry out your gospel, a gospel of peace. Fill us with your spirit deep within our hearts as we lift our eyes to worship you. Refill us with hope as we glimpse again the promise of heaven. We ask that you hear our collective prayer through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, as we begin this morning's service, we're going to join our voices in song as we join together in singing Amazing Grace.
Thank you for sitting, friends. And as we continue in our time of prayer, we acknowledge indeed by our human nature, by our own fragile personalities, that we are all sinners, but we are all sin sinners seeking redemption. We are all sinners seeking to access and to hold on to that promise of eternal salvation, a promise that we know we can cling to only through the cross, only through the love and the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, I invite you to bow with me for a time of prayer, and as you do so, you come to God sincerely and genuinely, speaking to Him as your Savior, not needing a mediator, not needing a middle person. And as you pray, as you say your silent prayer for a moment, I want you to reflect upon the past week, the past hour, the past months of moments and times when you know you did not reflect the glory and the light of the Lord's countenance. Moments and times when you would have fallen short of His grace, for words you would have used, thoughts you would have had, actions you would have meted out upon others. And this is your time and this is your moment to come to God on bended knees with penitent hearts and seek that promise of forgiveness. We spend a moment in silent prayer. We continue in the fellowship of prayer. Most holy and precious Lord, our eternal Father and Savior, under the conviction of your Spirit, as we have come to you gathered within the walls of your sanctuary and giving you thanks for this opportunity, we have learned, dear God, that many times the more that we seem to do, the more busy we become in our daily tasks, the worse we are as messengers and as disciples of your work and your will. We have realized, dear God, that the more we learn, many times it seems that it is the less we truly know. We acknowledge, dear God, that the more holy we assume to possess, the more sinful we seem to be. And the more we love, that there seems to be more there is to love. In this paradox, dear God, of sinfulness and goodness, we call out to you and acknowledge you as our eternal and ever-present Savior. We acknowledge dear, you, dear God, as being boundless in love and mercy. For we know of the times that we fail by our human nature to acknowledge you in our daily lives. So often, dear God, we become focused upon the tasks before us. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, to wait, to step aside. We ask you, dear God, to be that passenger in the car when we know that you should truly be the driver. Heavenly Father, for those moments, for those moments, dear God, we ask you to forgive us. For those repeated times, Heavenly Father, and for the cycle that we seem to fall into you, we reach out to you this morning, dear God, and we attempt to touch your nail-scarred hands, asking you to touch our hearts, to cleanse us, and to forgive us from all sins. So many times, dear God, we allow that fear and that fright and that timid nature to diminish our spiritual stature. And we do not grasp the opportunity and the chances that present themselves to speak from our strength and to speak of your goodness and your will. So many times, dear Lord, as human beings, we allow doubt to invade our hopefulness and we may degrade our own wisdom. Forgive us, dear God. And in that daily time, whenever we spend from sunrise to sunset, remind us again of your holy presence, a presence that continues to hover near us and in us. Free us, dear God, from shame and self-doubt. Help us to see you in the moment-by-moment -moment possibilities, possibilities which allow us to live honestly, to act honestly, and to speak from a wisdom that you have blessed us with. These mercies we ask of you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, the sacrificial lamb, our constant companion. Amen. Friends, we have two readings this morning. The first reading comes to us from the book of Psalms, Psalm 78, verses 1 to 8. And the second reading comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. And we shall have those readings now. Our first reading is taken from the book of Psalms, 
Psalm number 78. It is entitled, God and His People. After the reading, we all say the Gloria together. Listen, my people, to my teaching, and pay attention to what I say. I am going to use wise sayings and explain mysteries from the past. Things we have heard and known. Things that our ancestors told us. We will not keep them from our children. We will tell the next generation about the Lord's power and his great deeds and the wonderful things he has done. He gave laws to the people of Israel and commandments to the descendants of Jacob. He instructed our ancestors to teach his laws to their children so that the next generation might learn them and in turn shall tell their children. In this way, they also will put their trust in God and not forget what he has done, but always obey his commandments. They will not be like their ancestors, a rebellious and disobedient people whose trust in God was never firm and who did not remain faithful to him. The Gloria, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Good morning. The second scripture reading is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, and, is, and it is entitled, The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus saw the crowds and went up a hill where he sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those who mourn. God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble. They will receive what God has promised. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. Happy are those who are merciful to others. God will be merciful to them. Happy are the pure in heart, they will see God. Happy are those who work for peace, God will call them his children. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you are my followers. Be happy and glad for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his words. Indeed friends, is it wonderful to be within the walls of the sanctuary this morning? Are you feeling blessed? Amen? Amen. It is wonderful once more to have our doors open where we can join together in this time of fellowship and family, a time of friendship and worship and sharing this together. My brother Elijah, when um, I was rostered to come here this week, he kept calling me every day and reminding me, we have to keep it within the hour. He knows that I tend to be a bit lengthy and carry on sometimes. So I got my daily reminder, you know, God, good morning, God bless you. You're keeping the service within an hour. As I walked in this morning and I saw him, God bless you, my brother. He said, we have 90 minutes. But you would realize that our service was tailored a bit to take into consideration the original time frames. And we trust that you all will bear with us and you will continue to get the same feeling and inspiration that you would get from the normal lengthy services. God knows our hearts. He knows everything that we desire, but he gives us exactly what we need in our lives. Freely do we receive and so too freely do we give.
Friends, I invite you to bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Eternal God, we come to you this morning, dear Lord, thankful for this opportunity to be here within the walls of your holy tabernacle, to be worshiping together in this fellowship, to be singing praises to your glorious name, to hear your words proclaimed from Holy Scripture, and to hear your messages being delivered. But dear Lord, so many times by the events that unfold before us, events which we feel we have no control over. We sometimes feel battered and bruised. We ask you, dear God, in those moments and at those times that you be that constant shepherd, that good shepherd, that leader of the flock. You who know every member of your flock by name and we who know the sound of your voice and we ask you to lead and guide, to take us by your hands and carry us a little further on this earthly journey. We ask you, dear Lord, to be that great sculptor, that you can look at us and see those rough edges and you can chip them away, dear Lord, until we become true reflections of your countenance, true reflections of your image, but most of all, dear God, true reflections of your beauty and your grace. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our shield, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. You know, friends, at the end of this morning's message, I'm going to ask you one question, very simple question, very direct question. I'm going to simply ask you, are you a saint or are you a sinner? If you were to think about yourselves, think about your life so far, how would you define yourself if someone was to ask you to attach one of those names to you? Would you say that you are a saint? Would you say that you are a sinner? And as we talk this morning and as we meditate and as we reflect, I want you to keep that question at the back of your mind. And maybe you'll have an answer for me at the end. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll be like me. You'll still be thinking about it. Last week, 
we had a very significant day. It's a day where we normally set aside and we acknowledge if we haven't done for the balance of the year, we reflect upon those whom we've lost. We think about those who have passed on, those who have been called to that heavenly mansion, those who have gone forward to prepare a place for us. And many of us, we make trips to the crematoriums where we may have a little memoriam set up or we go to the cemeteries. We make sure that the plots are all taken care of and painted. We go in the evening with the candles and we light them because it's significant and it's symbolic and it reminds us of the impact that these loved ones would have had on our lives. The impact that they would have had in shaping us. And we call that the All Saints Day. It's a week later. And I'm here now and I'm going to ask you, we've celebrated All Saints Day, we've acknowledged it, it's been commemorated. So what exactly is a saint? You know, we use that word and we hear it, but sometimes we don't really think about what the exact meaning may be. If we think about a dictionary meaning for it, a saint would be considered to be someone or a person who is acknowledged as being holy and virtuous regarding in the Christian faith. Or others may say a saint is someone, a being, who is definitely taken to heaven after death. And all of these meanings will be correct. But the scriptures give us a very different or slightly different meaning. When we think about a saint and who is a saint, the scriptures indicate that a saint is a person who has decided to follow Jesus. St. Paul, when he addresses his letters to the different congregations, he calls the people that he's sending it out to saints. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1, he says, To the saints who are at, who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 1, he says, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. You see, the word saint comes from a Greek word, Hagios meaning to set aside. So saints are actually someone who has been set aside by God. And the thing about being a saint, it is a constant journey. It is a constant challenge. It is a constant battle of learning and following the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that brings us to our reading this morning from the gospel. In the gospel according to Matthew, we learn several attributes that have to deal with developing Christian character. We learn about several qualities that we must display if we are going to truly be considered saints. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 to 12, the nine attitudes that are expressed go as follows. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. And blessed are those who are insulted because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, these nine qualities, they reflect part of the character of God himself. They cannot reflect him in totality because as human beings and as mortals, we cannot truly comprehend all the magnificence of our creator. But it does give us a brief idea of part of his character. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, we are reminded that we are all made in the image of God. In other words, when someone looks at you, they see God. When they look at me, they see God. When they look at every one of us, they are supposed to see God. For we have been created in his image. And Jesus encourages us to seek the sort of character that would reflect God's character. Can we be created in his image and not reflect all the qualities of his character. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us to go forward and to love our enemies. Easy words to follow. 
Easy words to regurgitate. Easy words to spit out. Go and love your enemies. Supremely beautiful, but extremely difficult. Is it always easy to consider someone an enemy? Is it easy to go forward and show love to that person whom you consider a foe, an opponent, someone who contradicts you, someone who is very different, someone who is an enemy? And that's why we are reminded that being a Christian is not easy. In Luke chapter 9 verse 23, we are told, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and then follow me. Jesus sums up the law of God, not with outward signs of religion, but with inner attitudes of the heart. In other words, when Jesus says that to be a Christian, you have to take up your cross and follow me, he isn't saying go forward and make sure that you get nominated onto every board in the church, every committee and every arm. He's not saying that you have to do that so that people will look at you by the positions that you hold, by the people that you know, and say that is a holy person. That is a Christian. That is a saint. He doesn't do that. Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Know the challenges of what it means to be my disciple, my follower, my worker, and my witness of my will upon this, my vineyard. And he says, don't do it for people to hear you proclaiming on the street corners. Do it from within. Do it sincerely. Do it genuinely. Many times we see people who are so consumed with the idea of being religious that they forget what it means to be spiritual. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Show kindness to them. But we live in a selfish society. We live in a society that's give me, give me, give me. We live in a society that is so selfish that people become self-centered. People become narrow-minded. But the two great commandments that are given are anything but selfish. Friends, different people have different interpretations of the scripture. That's the beauty of it. When I was younger and I sat where you are in congregations, I would say, blessed are those who do not preach long. Because it was very difficult to sit through a long service. 60 minutes. Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 reminds us that blessed are those who hunger and those who thirst for righteousness. But what exactly is righteousness? You see, God's righteousness, the righteousness that is displayed for us to emulate and for us to imitate, for us as disciples to follow, that righteousness is God's intrinsic holiness. It is the moral perfection of God. When the title, the messianic title, Righteous One is given, it is done so because it is inspired by hope and belief in a Messiah, in a Savior. Man's righteousness, however, is a call to strive and to follow and to try to imitate God's righteousness. We can never be as perfect as our Creator. There has been only one perfect being to walk along this earthly vineyard and he was placed upon that cross, sacrificed for all our sins. We as human beings will never achieve that perfection, but we are called to strive for it, to reach for it, to grab for it, to try to imitate all the perfect examples that he displayed for us to follow. Jesus calls us as Christians to change how we live and to follow him. You know, there's that popular hymn that has the verse, the cross before me, the world behind me. And we are called to do that, to focus on the cross, to focus upon the example of our Lord and try to follow that. Because for many of us, we have all achieved salvation already. Salvation is the act of becoming a Christian by acceptance of Jesus and our Lord as our Savior. And we have all done that, seated here, worshiping together. We are on the road to achieving salvation. But then there's the other word that we don't use. There's sanctification, which allows Jesus to mold our lives now that we have accepted him as our Savior. To allow him to change and shape and mold our lives 
into the way that he wants it. So many of us, we are able to do that. We ask him, God, be our savior. Forgive us for all our transgressions and our sins. But when he wants to take us and mold us and move us forward, we become resistant. We find all the excuses and all the reasons of why we cannot be there for him to move us along this chessboard. Being righteous in God's sight is a call for us as Christians. We are all called to be righteous and we do so by working upon the weakness of our character. We all have flaws. We all have traits that need to be improved. We all have different qualities and aspects of our life that requires us to drop on our knees and ask for forgiveness time and time again. Because life is not that easy journey where we ask for forgiveness one time and we are able to stay away and abstain from all wrongdoings. That is the beauty and that is the challenge of being a human and going through this gift of life. But God gives us that opportunity to acknowledge when we have done wrong and to come to him seeking that forgiveness and acknowledging our own wrongdoing. And that is being righteous in God's sight, working on a weakness of character, working and trying the fortitude to acknowledge that we have flaws in our spiritual life that need strengthening, that need reinforcing, that need fortifying. It's like the atheist who once said, I would be a Christian if it wasn't for the Christians. Or as the philosopher Ralph Emerson said, your actions speak so loudly, I cannot hear what you are saying. That is so profound. Do our actions as we sit here and as we go to our homes and as we engage and meet and treat with each others, do our actions speak positively? Do our actions and what we do speak so loudly that no one needs to listen to our voices? Or are our actions humming a negative sound, drowning out any good and killing the enthusiasm of those who are around us? Chesterton once said it, do not show someone the door of the church from the inside of the building. It's a quote that I love to use and it's so profound. By our actions, do we show someone the door of the church from the outside when we tell them, use it as an entrance and enter and worship and join with us and stay with us and become part of this family? Or do we by our actions when we reflect and when we think and when we act, are we pointing to the door from the inside to some people and making them use it as a hasty exit? Friends, our actions should speak so loudly as Christians that no one can hear what we are saying. You see, God's interest, God's interest is upon our inner being. You know, there's an expression that is used a lot. You have the face that only a mother could love. I come from a large family, a lot of siblings. And whereas the others were blessed with good looks, I tell people I was blessed with personality and a great sense of humor. And we use that line that, you know, you have a face that only a mother will love, meaning you're not too pretty. The thing about it is God isn't concerned with how we are physically. God is concerned with your inner being, what you have in your heart, what comes out from you, what actions emanate because of the feelings that you really and truly have. In Matthew chapter 15 verse 11, it tells us what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that makes him unclean. Do we ever pause and reflect about what we are spewing when we speak? There's an expression that we use that in leadership training they always give. They say it is not what you say to someone, it's how you say it to them. Are we inspiring and are we engaging people in that enthusiasm and moving them forward to use their skills within the church? Or are we simply making people feel frustrated, making them lose sight and focus? You know, in our reading from the gospel, God is asking us, where's your heart? In Matthew chapter 5 verse 8, we are told, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Every quality that has been listed for us has to do with Christian character creation. Becoming a true Christian. 
It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And that reading brings to us all the pieces that we need if we are going to be this holistic Christian on the road to sainthood. How many of us can do like King David in Psalm chapter 26 verse 2 and invite God and say, examine my heart and my mind. If God was to do that, would he be pleased with the progress that we are making? Because as human beings, we are reminded of the war that Paul talks about. Paul, the great apostle, in trying to explain what righteousness means, he touches on the war that happens within each and every one of us. In Romans chapter 7, verses 18 to 20, he says, For even though the desire to do good is in me, I am not able to do it. I don't do the good I want to do. Instead, I do the evil I do not want to do. And if Paul, the great apostle, could acknowledge that within himself, who am I? Who are you? We do not do the good that we want to do. Instead, we do the evil that we do not want to do. And so many times as we sit here worshiping this morning, we realize that this is true in our own lives. And it speaks to righteousness being a relationship with our Creator. In Genesis chapter 15 verse 6, we know that story so well. Abraham, faithful Abraham, he's blessed with a son well into his old age. He has longed for this child and then God gives him the ultimate challenge. I want you to take your son and you're going to sacrifice him to me. And you're going to go where I tell you. You're going to place him upon an altar that you're going to see there. And you're going to sacrifice this son, this child that you've longed for, this child, child who has brought you so much joy and happiness. How many of us would have been able to do that? How many of us would have challenged God's will? How many of us would have thought, okay, that's not God speaking. That's some voice in my head. You see, Abraham's action in that story in Genesis, in that excerpt, it showed faith. James said in James chapter 2, verse 18, I will show you my faith by my actions. And then in chapter 2, verse 21, he refers to this. And he says, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, friends, in building Christian character, in acknowledging righteousness, we acknowledge that faith and actions work together. That is the relationship that God calls us to. That our faith must complement our actions. Our actions must speak of our faith. It must reflect our faith. Faith was made complete by what Abraham did. And the scriptures were fulfilled. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. A person, a Christian, is justified by what he does and not by saying that he or she has faith alone. You have to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Abraham's relationship with God was credited as righteousness. You know, perhaps we may find the key this morning in our relationship, in our relationship with Jesus Christ, we may find that key that will unlock our understanding to the words of Jesus. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Matthew chapter 5 verse 6. The ultimate reminder of what Christian character, of what building that relationship is. That those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for purity, for goodness, for His grace they are going to be filled they are going to be sustained they are going to be strengthened they are going to be supported for that is what being a saint is all about so this morning i ask you are you a saint or are you a sinner thanks be to god in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen and amen friends we bow our heads in prayer And as we do so, we bring to God our church, our people, our flock, our family. We come to God acknowledging our journey, acknowledging to God that we are trying and emulating the work and the image that he has left for us to follow. 
We acknowledge that as human beings we have so much work yet to be done, but we know that he will be with us on this journey. We continue in the fellowship of prayer. Eternal God, we come to you, Heavenly Father, thanking you once more, loudly and proudly, that we can gather within the walls of your sanctuary, that we can come there, God, into your house, into your home, and join together in this time of worship. We remember and we are constantly reminded that where two or more are gathered, there you shall be. And as you walk amongst us this morning, dear God, we ask you to imbibe our hearts with your heavenly spirit to help us, dear Lord, to be filled with your goodness and your grace, to help us, Heavenly Father, to reflect the light of your love, the blessings that you would be unto others. Allow that to be our role, Heavenly Father. As we pray this morning, dear God, we give you thanks for keeping our members safe, for protecting us, for guiding our steps. We acknowledge, dear God, the danger of the times. We acknowledge, dear God, the scares that everyone may have. But we move by faith, dear God. And as we are called to demonstrate this faith, we acknowledge you as our savior, as our guide, as our friend, and as our leader. We acknowledge, dear God, the words found in Philippians, that we can accomplish all things through faith in you. And we demonstrate that faith this morning, dear God. Father, as we pray, we ask your blessings upon members throughout our congregation. Those, dear God, who have celebrated in times of happiness and joy, moments of celebration, and even though these celebrations may be a bit quiet, may be a bit serene, may be a bit calm, to what we are normally expecting, we ask you to be with them and to bless them with many years of such happiness in times of birthdays, anniversaries, times of success at work and success at school. Dear Lord, we bring before you our students, students throughout our congregation, those who would have written those recent high-stake exams and received their results. We thank you, dear God, for their success. We thank you, dear God, for your touch in their lives. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to be with members of our congregation, those who cannot be with us, dear God, those, Heavenly Father, who are joining us from the comfort of their homes, but worshiping not the same, transforming those homes into smaller sanctuaries of your goodness and your will. Be with them, dear God, and let them know that they are missed, but let them know that they are still part of this fellowship, this fold, and this family. Continue to guide them continue to touch them dear Lord for we know that you are omnipresent and you are everywhere all at once and we know that you are with every member sincerely worshiping here with you dear God we ask that you will be with your people we ask dear God that you will be with members of your flock who may not be where you would expect them to be emotionally mentally and even spiritually help them dear God to remember the words of faith Help them, dear God, to remember to demonstrate that faith, a faith that needs no words, a faith that needs no speech, a faith that speaks loudly. Let them all remember that you do not abandon your people, but you give us sometimes a larger cross to carry because it helps us to cross a chasm later on in our lives. Heavenly Father, as we pray, we say a special prayer for our country. A special prayer for those, dear God, in the protective services and the medical services, those frontline workers, Heavenly Father, who continue to labor tirelessly, providing that care for those who need it. We ask you to be with them and to touch them in their lives. We ask you, dear God, to bless everyone who continue to labor and toil in some form or fashion, dear God, to continue to move this country forward. We know the challenges internationally and we ask you dear God that you continue to be with your people that you continue to be a true Trini that you continue to ease the pain and ease the stress for so many father as we pray we ask your blessings upon the leaders throughout our country those who have assumed that mantle of leadership and let them remember that in all decisions it impacts upon an innocent nation Help them to remember that these decisions and their words can impact positively or it can impact negatively. Let them in some way realize that they are called to demonstrate the qualities of Christianhood. And let them remember that they are called to be examples and reflections of your countenance. Help them, dear God, in decisions that they make to seek your guidance, to seek your wisdom. 
And as we all remember that we are on this path, a path that takes us to be true saints, a path that allows us to continue to compose and create a Christian character, let us remember, dear God, that we are called to be disciples. And discipleship so many times reflects upon the actions that we show, actions that are guided by the prayer that Jesus took the time to teach to his followers, and which we pause and take that moment to chant together now as we join our voices together in saying that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Friends are closing him, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, clear for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin a double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy lost demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All good. Thou must save and thou
Things of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with you, your loved ones, and all of God's people everywhere, both now and forevermore.